Hey, my name is Milan and in today's video we're going to talk about Cartesian Explosion which can be detrimental to your database performance. I'm going to explain what Cartesian Explosion is, when it happens and what you can do to solve this problem so that you can avoid slowing down your application. Let me first set the scene and show you the application that I'm going to use to highlight the Cartesian Explosion problem. I have an EF Core database context that I'm configuring to use an underlying RDS database running in the AWS cloud. We're going to use Postgres, but the same problem applies to any relational database. Our database context has a few entities. We have a department that can have one or many teams. Each team can have one or many employees. Each employee can have one or many tasks and one or many salary payments. So we have a hierarchical structure where we have a department on top which contains some teams, teams contain employees, and each employee has their own tasks and salary payments. So this is our data model that I'm going to use to highlight the Cartesian explosion problem. And if you want to try this out, I also added a C database exception that's going to connect to your database and generate some random fake data so that you can test out the Cartesian explosion issue. I'm using Bogus to generate some fake departments, fake teams, fake employees, fake tasks, and fake salary payments. And then you can configure how much data you want to seed into your database. I'm just seeding one department with 100 teams and every team can have between 100 and 1000 employees and an employee can have a large number of tasks and salary payments, most of which are going to be completed when it comes to the tasks. And then for the salary payments, we expect most of them to also be in the past because our employees have been with us for a long time. Time. So this is our data model and we're going to seed some initial data into the database and now let me explain what Cartesian Explosion is and why it's problematic when it comes to database performance. Cartesian Explosion comes from the Cartesian product or cross product which is an operation between two distinct sets. What we want to do is to calculate a product between these two sets and this is very typical in relational algebra. When you have two relations or two tables in a relational database you can join between these two tables and produce a new set containing the product of these two tables. And when it comes to the cross product or cross join operation, here is why this can be problematic. Let's say I have two relations or tables, A and B, and each of them contains two rows. If I wanted to calculate a cross product between these two tables, I would have to take the rows from the first table. Let's say we take the first row and match them to all of the rows in the second table. And then I need to do the same for the remaining rows in the first table. So this is the cross product between these two tables. We have two rows in each of the initial tables and the cross product contains four rows. So two times two. Now, if we take this further, let's say our two tables now contain three rows each. The cross product is going to contain nine rows. And you can imagine how this grows as the number of rows in our tables increases. Now let's go back to our initial example with the department, teams, and employees and illustrate this problem with a practical query. So I'm connecting to my RDS database, which is in the AWS cloud. And I'm doing this for a very particular reason. And this is because I want the network round trip time to also have an impact in the time it takes to execute my query. So let's write a simple query. Let's say select star from employees and I want to join the employee to the tasks table. So I'm going to join on the tasks and then let's define the join condition. We want to join based on the employee ID column in the tasks table and join this to the employee ID column in the employees table. Let's also add a filter to look for one employee for example, I'm going to say that the employee ID is equal to one. And let's execute this query. Of course, if I could write SQL, then this would work. I made a mistake here, so let me fix this. And let's execute this query now. And this time we get a result back. So I'm just going to update my setup here to let it fetch all of the rows that we have. And you can see that we get a response back in 0.01 seconds. And the result contains 532 rows. So this is one query that I wanted to show you. Now let's do another query. So I'm going to select from employees. And this time I want to join on the salary payments. And let's join on the salary payment employee ID. And let's check if that's equal to the employee ID. And I want to filter out the salary payments for just one employee. Now, when I execute this query, it's also going to return back the join between these two tables. And this time we have 119 rows. Another thing that is important to highlight here is that even though we have just one employee, 
the data for this employee is duplicated for each row in the join table. In this case, these are the tasks and salary payments. So to return each task or salary payment from the database, we have to duplicate the employee information in each of the rows. This is just how SQL works. And this is a bit unfortunate because we will be transferring duplicate data across the network. And this is another reason why I wanted to use a remote database so that this actually has some impact. Okay, so far, so good. Our queries are pretty fast, executing in under a second. And now this is where things become interesting. Let's say we select everything from the employees table and then let's do a join on the tasks table. So I will say join on tasks and the task employee ID is equal to the employee ID. And then let's join on the salary payments table and let's also specify the same condition. So salary payment employee ID is equal to the employee ID. And of course, I want to filter out the records for just one employee with the ID of one. Let me fix my query. Okay, this should be good now. And this time, when I execute the query, watch what is going to happen. You see, it took a bit of a moment to load the results. And our result set contains 63,308 rows. Let me read that again. 63,308 rows to join one employee with their tasks and salary payments. If I go back to our initial two queries, so we only had 532 tasks for this employee and they also had 119 salary payments. But when we join on these two tables for this employee, we end up with a result set that contains 63,308 rows. So that's an entire order of magnitude more records than we actually need. And this is how we end up with Cartesian explosion. We first join on these two relations, the employees and tasks, and we get 500 something rows. And then we are going to join all of those rows to the salary payments table. And this is how we end up with 60,000 rows in the result set. So we end up with a lot of duplication in the result set for the employee, for the tasks, and for the salary payments. And you can imagine how this impacts performance. So when I execute this query, it takes almost one second to give me back the results. And the significant component of the performance or the slowness of this query is the time it takes to transfer 63,000 rows from RDS to my local machine here so that we can observe the results. So let's go back to our application and I want to show you a few practical queries that you can write with EF Core that further highlight this problem. And I also want to show you how you can solve this problem using EF Core in a very simple way. Let's go ahead and create a few minimal API endpoints that are going to query our database and then give us back some results. So let's start with an endpoint that's going to give me back a department with a specific identifier. And then it's also going to include the teams for that department. Let's make this async. I'm going to include the ID from the route and I will need my database context to write my query. In the body of this minimal API endpoint, I'm going to say department or rather departments because this is going to be plural. And then I will say context departments. I'm going to include the teams for this department. So we will eagerly load all of the teams. Then let's add as no tracking. I'm going to filter out for a department with this ID. And then let's just say to list async because I want to return a collection, although you could return just the one department that there is. While we are here, let's also create another endpoint that's going to include both the teams and the employees. So don't pay too much attention to how I'm naming these endpoints. I'm just trying to define something sensible. And this time I need to say then include, and then I can use the teams to load the respective navigation property that contains the employees. So these queries are similar, but in the first one, we are just loading the teams. And in the second one, we also want to eagerly load the employees. I'm going to add one more endpoint and let's keep going further down the hierarchy chain. And let's say we want to include the tasks for the employee. So I can say then include, then I will use the employee to select the tasks navigation property. So I think we have enough to demonstrate our initial problem. So let's go ahead and start the application and test out these queries. So let's send the first query for a department with this identifier. And we are going to include the respective teams for this department. If I send this query a few more times, you can see that we get a response back in under 100 milliseconds. So far, so good. Now let's check out the next query where we are fetching the teams and this time we include the employees for each team. So if I send this query, you can see that it takes a bit longer, 
but if I keep sending it, it's going to stabilize. And even this query gives us back the response in under 200 milliseconds. Now, let me show you the third example where I'm including the department with their teams, employees, and tasks. And if I send this request, we're going to wait to get the response back and we will continue waiting until we hit the timeout that EF Core has by default, which is around 30 seconds. And this is because this query, although it doesn't encounter the cross product in our relational database, is going to load a very large number of records, which is going to both slow down the database because it has to load so many records. And it's also going to impact how much we have to transfer over the network from our database to our server. And you can see after 30 seconds from sending the request, we're going to encounter the timeout and we will throw an exception. So a solution for this is to simply load less data from your database. You can do this, first of all, by filtering your data to only fetch the data that you actually need. Do we really need all of the teams and all of the employees and all of their tasks or just some of them? And the second thing that you can do is to not transfer the entire database into your server. And you can do this using projections. So these are just some common sense best practices when it comes to querying the database. But let's also look at our other example where we have a cross product in our database. So we were loading the employees with a specific ID. And let's say that we want to include the tasks for this employee. So let me just update this query. We are returning the employees. For each employee, I'm going to include their tasks because I want to load only tasks for this query and we are filtering based on the employee ID. Now let's also create another query that's going to return the salary payments. Let's just say salaries and let's include the salary payments. And then let's do another query without any arguments here. And I'm going to include both the salary payments and the tasks. Now notice that we are doing two include statements, which means that this is translated into SQL, is going to generate two joins that are on the same level of hierarchy. We are joining to the employees table in both of the join statements. So let me show you the performance impact between these queries. So let's say we want to fetch an employee with the ID of one and also include their tasks. So if I send this request a few more times, we get back a response in under 200 milliseconds. So far, so good. Now let's also fetch the salaries. This time we get a response back in under 100 milliseconds. But when I want to fetch the employee with the same ID, but this time also include the task and the salary payments in the same query, we get the response back in almost a second. So you can see that the slowdown here is significant because we have a cross product happening in our database. So there is actually a simple way how you can solve this problem with EF Core. And the only thing we have to change is to make this a split. So I'm just adding one line of code here and then let's restart the application and let's send this same query again and observe the results. So if I send it a few more times, you can see that now we are getting the result back in under 200 milliseconds. This is a significant performance improvement, but what is actually happening? So let me send this query again and I place the breakpoint here so that we can execute this query in memory and then I will open up my console so that we can observe the SQL queries that are sent to our database. So you can see the first query here, which is fetching an employee by the ID. Then we have another query in the context of the same API request, but this time joining between the employees and the tasks table for this employee. And if we look further, you can see another query, which is fetching from the employees and salary payments table. So what is happening here? is that EF Core is going to split this query into three distinct queries, one for each of the relations or tables that we want to load from the database. So we have one SQL query for the employees, one SQL query for the tasks, and one SQL query for the salary payments. This is how split queries work. Now let me stop this. And I want to highlight that query splitting isn't really a silver bullet. It won't solve all of your querying problems, but it's very helpful for some problems, especially when you have a cross product. The obvious downside when using query splitting is that you will have multiple round trips to your database. So this can be significant if the latency between your API server and your database is large. And this is the main reason why I'm using a database in the AWS cloud to hopefully highlight this problem to some extent. Another issue with split queries is consistency. You could run into a situation where a concurrent update lands on the tasks or salary payments table while you are still fetching the employees. For example, we could load the employees and tasks 
and then send a query to load these salary payments. And in the meantime, a task could be added or removed for this employee. When using split queries, there is a risk for a concurrent update going into your database and altering the result set, which means that you will be returning stale data. If you want to, you can also configure query splitting on the database context level. So here I can specify another argument that gives me access to the MPG SQL options. And then I can say use query splitting behavior and specify that I want all queries to be split by providing the value of query splitting behavior split query. Now in that case, all of our queries are going to be split queries. And if I want to revert this behavior, I can say as single query on an individual link query to revert the behavior. But I don't want to use this and let's roll back this change. So we only want to opt in to query splitting when we actually need it. And to help you decide when you do need it or not, it's best that you actually do some benchmarks. So I introduced a benchmark project behind the scenes and here I'm going to test out two queries, one for fetching the department with the teams and the employees and then the same query with the only difference being that we will use query splitting and i also have an example of returning an employee with a specific id and we are including the tasks and salary payments and we have a regular version and a split query version so let's go ahead and run these benchmarks and then let's discuss the results and see if query splitting makes sense in all situations so our benchmark results are in and you can see that they are a little surprising this is because our first query that's fetching the department is actually faster as a regular ef core queries whereas the split query is somewhat slower so in this example query splitting doesn't give us a significant performance improvement However, when it comes to fetching the employees with their tasks and salaries, the regular query is around 700 milliseconds and the split query is under 100 milliseconds. So this is a significant performance improvement and you can see how query splitting is helpful in this query, but not in the first query where we just fetch the department with the relevant navigation properties. So my advice is use query splitting with caution and definitely measure if you really need to use it and it gives you a significant performance improvement because this might not always be the case. If you enjoyed this video, then I think that you should watch this video next. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to improve your skills. And until next time, stay awesome.